Jasmine, it's yours. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks very much for, for joining us for the first Living Histories of 2024. We're really excited and honored to have Sergei Maslov to tell us a little bit about his living history. Pass it on to Sergei. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me and again, Sri and Charlie for introducing me. So I'm very honored to uh, to participate in this uh, in this uh, in this series. I have listened to a few of the talks and I learned a lot of the interesting stories about my colleagues. Um, so just uh, briefly about myself. Right now, I'm calling you. You know, I'm zooming from the uh, Institute for Genomic Biology, Carl Lowe's Institute for Genomic Biology, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, I'm a professor of bioengineering and physics, and I'm also a co-director of Center for Artificial Intelligence and Modeling there. Uh, and I'll tell you about my sort of career trajectory, how somebody who was trained as a theoretical physicist ended up doing biology. So that is, as far as I understand, is the main uh, lesson we are all learning from those from this series. So uh, again, I was born in a, into a family of scientists. Uh, two of my grandparents, both my mother and father, my only sister, her son, my two sons, well, they are still training, but they are all on a trajectory to become scientists. And actually six out of eight of them are physicists. And the seventh one was trained as a physicist, but then switched to computer science. So maybe there is some sort of a physics gene, some hiding somewhere, and maybe it will be interesting to investigate. I'm joking, of course. Uh, then I, again, I was born and raised in Moscow, and I moved to US when I was 23. I was educated in mathematical high school. And during this education, which uh, gave me an excellent uh, early exposure to mathematics, my dream was to become a pure mathematician, maybe specialize in something like topology or calculus. And then through a variety of reasons, I actually got uh, into a, a physics university, a physics department at Moscow Institute for, uh, of Science and Technology. And then after three years, there is a fork in the road of every young physicist who is a member of this, uh, of this uh, university or institute is either you are a theorist, become a theorist or experimentalist. And I choose a path of a theorist. And I was based at the Landau Institute for Theoretical Physics, which was at the time a completely incredible place with the highest concentration of world-class theoretical physicists probably anywhere in the world. Uh, my sort of advisors or maybe older colleagues, if you want, were string theorists such as Bol uh, Belavin, Polikov, the Malachikov, Valery Pekrovsky, who is a world-class condensed matter physics, uh, uh, theorist and and statistical uh, physics theorist was my undergraduate advisor. People like Liv Livido, Kalugin, and uh, Kitaev were working on quasi-crystals. They were kind of younger generation. And I spent incredible three years at this uh, institution and got really a solid training, what I hope is a solid training in, uh, in uh, uh, statistical uh, theoretical physics. And then uh, came my move to U.S. because uh, doors have been open from the USSR. USSR fell apart. And in 1992, pretty much everybody at the Landau Institute moved uh, elsewhere. And I moved to become a graduate student at Stony Brook University in New York. And the reason why I actually ended up at Stony Brook University goes back to my advisor, Per Bach. Um, I was, uh, my uh, undergraduate advisor was a visiting scientist with Per Bach. He invited me over and we kind of hit it off with Per Bach and he told me that I can uh, easily uh, become a graduate student at Stony Brook at nearby Stony Brook University. And I worked on something very uh, pure and very abstract complex systems at their birth, models of self-organized criticality, sand pile models uh, generated by Per Bach, Chow Tang. Kurt Wesenfeld and Kim Snappen. And then for my postdoc, I decided to switch fields. I was actually a little bit dissatisfied with the lack of connection to the experiment of all of those models. And I decided to try my luck in a pure condensed matter theory. I worked on low dimensional quantum magnets with Vic Emery, Gen Shirane, and my classmate, Andrew Jalodiv, who did a fantastic 
neutron scattering experiments at BNL. And after doing it for three years, I realized that I was actually right in the beginning that I uh, correctly identified the field of complex systems. That's what really was making me tick. And I, in parallel with my interest in low dimensional quantum magnets and in parallel with my PhD studies, I also worked extensively on uh, uh, summer collaboration with Yichen Zhang, who is a G and KPZ equation. And I worked on econophysics, which is the uh, application of statistical physics to stock price fluctuations or product recommendations and so on. So I kind of stayed on Long Island for 20 plus years. I came as a student, then I became a postdoc, and then I became a faculty member, uh, which was actually an incredible place to, to, to do a faculty, to get a faculty position because it gave you a really a lot of freedom. Uh, so uh, let me see. Uh, I became a junior faculty in 98, and I was really told to work on whatever I feel like. That was a dream kind of a position. And for a first couple of years, I was still trying to continue in condensed matter physics or maybe in econophysics. And then came a big switch, a big switch. I can point it precisely down to a year. There was a first bioconference organized at ITP in Santa Barbara. Uh, back then it was just ITP, not KITP as we know it now. It was a six months long program organized by Terry Kwa, Chao Tang and many others. Uh, called Statistical Physics of Biological Information. Uh, my, my wife, who is an artist who came with me, she designed actually a poster, a logo for the whole conference, which I showed here, serve the genome. And they invited an incredible array of world-class biologists who were patient enough to listen to questions, very naive questions from physicists asking, what is a gene, what is a protein? And by the end of this uh, six month long program, I was converted. And I, uh, you know, I worked on biology ever since pretty much 23 years. The other thing which helped me to switch is that in Santa Barbara, I overlapped with my, what, what, who became my long-term collaborator, Kim Snappen. He switched to biology maybe a couple of years before that, maybe three years before that. Uh, and he was working from the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. We were lucky enough to publish early paper uh, on networks, which uh, ended up in science. And so I kind of thought that after this, everything would be easy. And uh, uh, it turned out that it was a fluke. As we all know, the papers in high profile journals are unpredictable. Uh, but I work on biology 20 years and uh, I kind of try to switch my fields every 10 years or so. So kind of the first epoch of my interest in biological topics was in uh, 2001, 2012, roughly speaking, genome-wide biological networks. We started with working on topology of networks, which everybody uh, did at the time. Then we kind of started thinking, what can we do beyond network topology? And we uh, proposed some ideas about mass action dynamics of protein dimerization networks uh, back in 2007. Uh, surprisingly, this kind of topic is now coming to the forefront. I was uh, just a month ago, I was talking to uh, Mike Alovitz, who at Caltech, who is doing some experiments on those dimerization networks and wants to use them as some sort of analog computers. Uh, then my next kind of uh, interest in biology came uh, sort of after this, partially in peril with this, and it was devoted to evolution of bacterial genomes. Uh, we were interested in why the number of transcription factors scales as the square of the number of genes. That's so-called the Parkinson's law, why the bureaucrats are slowly taking over bacterial genome, uh, genomes. And then uh, while I was at Brookhaven, I actually uh, collaborated with an incredible scientist, Bill Studier, uh, who, uh, to whom we, for instance, owe the ability to mass produce proteins in, in bacterial hosts. Uh, he was the uh, person who invented this technology and the uh, Brookhaven uh, lab where I worked got uh, tens of millions of dollars of patent money for this technology. With him, we worked on homologous recombination in E. coli genomes and uh, published several papers together. Uh, then in 2015, it was time for me to move to Urbana-Champaign, where I am happily residing ever since. Uh, and it also coincided with my transition of working on microbial communities. Uh, I started working on 
stage microbial interactions with skin snapping again, then slowly but gradually I switch to work on microbial ecosystems, how microbes compete for resources. And then there were like for many of us, there were those incredible one year or two years when uh, I worked almost exclusively on modeling of COVID-19 uh, together with Nigel Goldenfeld, who was my uh, colleague and neighbor at the IGB. Uh, we actually advised the state of Illinois and we advised our university. We ran those weekly modeling forecasts for the entire state. Uh, so that was an interesting experience, even though scientifically, I don't really see myself continuing in those models, but we managed to publish a, a number of uh, interesting papers on the topic before I moved on. And I guess, uh, you know, the one of my charges is to try to give some sort of my, share my experience of what, how I would advise uh, uh, young people or earlier career scientists on what, what definitely worked for me. So I have kind of three pieces of advice to early career scientists. One is only do science if you really get fun, if you can have fun in the process of doing science, in the process of making models, writing papers, not based on the results, not based on the publication grants you get, but just from getting the, you know, when you're in the middle of doing science, if you have fun doing this, this is your field. If not, there are plenty of other ways of making money, uh, much more money. But again, from my experience, that science gives you incredible intellectual freedom and uh, gives you opportunity to work with many creative people. The second piece of advice depends on whether you are an experimentalist or a theorist. If you are an experimentalist, go to one subfield of science and stay there. If you are a theorist, you have this luxury of switching fields because it's relatively low overhead for you to switch from one subfield to another. And I did it definitely, as, a, as I explained in the previous slide. Uh, so my kind of, uh, the formula which worked well for me is to spend maybe three quarters of your effort working on one subfield, whereas the uh, 25% to work in another subfield. And right now, I, as I said, I work on microbial communities, but I did dedicate maybe a quarter of my time thinking and working on machine learning and origin of life. And the last piece of advice is, again, sort of maybe obvious, is that the, the really, if you're a theorist, you need to simplify your way of thinking about uh, biology. Biology is complicated. Unless you simplify, you are completely in the woods. Simplify your thinking and translate the simplification in the, into your models. And which brings me to the last slide, which I think is, uh, uh, is I show it often in my talks. So those of you who have seen my talks have seen it. So we all know about top-down and bottom-up models. And what Kim Snappen and I advocate is something which we call a bottom-down models. The way to determine if a model is a bottom-down model is how many parameters it has and still given a meaningful and interesting description of the problem in question. Uh, so if it has a zero parameter, you get A plus and you get a Pear Buck Memorial Award. One parameter is A, two parameters B, and so on. And so if you have a candidates of uh, uh, an interest in bottom-down models and you want to become a member of the bottom-down modeling society, please write to me or to Kim and we would happily, uh, you know, review it and, and accept you to the society if, if it merits. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sergey. Uh, in, the, in the interest of time, I'm going to take one question from, from the chat. Um, so you described being surrounded by, you know, a lot of these prominent, eminent academics from a very late age, uh, all the way through to your graduate training. And given given the surroundings, were there any special challenges in finding your own voice and your own interests that you had to contend with as a result? Yes, yes, of course. And again, you know, one one thing is that you have to make yourself different from uh, from your advisors. Second of all, science is, is risky and unpredictable business. So nobody is guaranteed a faculty position. Nobody is guaranteed uh, that that you will be given to the opportunity to work on what you want. And again, I has been I have been incredibly lucky in my career uh, in in getting this opportunity and this freedom to do what I want. And uh, and again, I I don't have any special tips on how to distinguish yourself from your uh, senior colleagues, just follow your, 
your nose of what you find is. But of course, you learn from them this interest, this uh, ad admiration to simplicity is I got from all of my advisors, all of my senior collaborators. Thanks so much.